worship, people of Grandview, it is good to be with, with you in your spaces virtually this morning. And yes, we are nearing a time of restarting in-person worship. There's going to be more information coming to you about that uh, in the weeks to come. But um, gosh, it is, it, it is great to still be with you in, in this way. And um, I'm just so thankful to hear from so many of you on a week-to-week -week basis, checking in, telling us how you're doing, and, uh, and also the, the wonderful feedback that we've received on the uh, online worship that we've been able to provide during this time. This morning, we are actually sort of returning to a new space. This is our second Sunday after Pentecost, which means that we are now in what's considered common time. And you'll notice there's lots of green around, and uh, we haven't seen green on the altar or in our pyramids since I think it was February 16th. So this feels like a return to something familiar and I'm so thankful for that. So I just wanna say welcome and if you are a guest and this is your first time or maybe your first few times of joining us, you are especially welcome and we are glad that you are joining in with us and uh, welcome to worship and enjoy this experience as we come together to celebrate Christ Jesus. Please join us in the call to worship. As a shepherd seeks a lost sheep, so God seeks and saves the lost. Like a woman who searches for a lost coin until it is found, so God rejoices over one soul restored to wholeness. As a father receives a returning wayward son, so God welcomes us and lets the past be the past. Therefore, let us praise God in thanksgiving that we are received. Let, let us receive and welcome and rejoice over one another. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The reading this morning is from Psalms chapter 116, verses 1 through 19. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and supplications, because he inclined his ear to me. Therefore, I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid on me. I suffered distress and anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walked before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith, even when he said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of the people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Our hymn this morning is God whose love is reigning over us.
in our opening prayer. O heavenly creator, we, your humble children, invoke your blessing on us. We adore you, whose name is love, whose nature is compassion, whose presence is joy, whose world is true, whose spirit is goodness, whose holiness is beautiful, whose whose will is peace, whose service is perfect, freedom and and knowledge for whom stands our eternal life. Unto you be all honor and all glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Our Lord. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning is Matthew 9, 35 through 10 a. Then Jesus went all about the cities and villagers, reaching their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 apostles and gave them authority under their unclean spirits to cast them out and cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 disciples. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, and the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canadian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. The twelve, these twelve got sent out with the following instructions. Go num, nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. People of Grandview, join me in an attitude of prayer. Creator God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, God, are our rock and our strength and our redeemer. Amen. People of Grandview, during common time, I typically try to balance my sermon text selection between the Old and New Testament passages. I've mentioned this before, but I do it intentionally the same as I choose to be a lectionary preacher. In other words, preaching from the prescribed texts each week, so that in a cycle of three years' time, we have actually been through the entire Bible. However, the, the season of Easter and Pentecost are so appropriately focused on the stories of the New Testament that it keeps our focus away from the Old Text for nearly four months. So as we return to common time this week, which you can tell it's common time because of the green everywhere, well, as we return to common time, it felt important to reach back and use one of the Old Testament texts to bring our message for this morning. And what better way to do that than to read from the Psalms? It's truly one of my favorite groups of texts in the Old Testament. If you've ever learned about slave Bibles, you may already be familiar with what I'm about to share this morning. When slavery was legal, its proponents often justified it with biblical scripture. Specifically, a verse that tells servants to obey their masters. There were also a lot of verses that abolitionists could and did use to argue against slavery, but you wouldn't find those in the heavily redacted slave Bibles of the time. Slave Bibles are 
Bibles that were edited and specifically produced to give to enslaved people. Well, in those texts, most of the Old Testament is missing. And in fact, only about half of the New Testament remains. Why? Well, so the enslaved Africans couldn't read or be read anything that might incite them to rebel. The first slave Bible was published in 1807. That was about three years after the Haitian Revolution ended. That revolution was the only slave revolt in history wherein the enslaved people successfully drove out their European oppressors to form a new nation. And it increased American and European paranoia that the people they oppressed would one day rise up against them. Many scholars suggest that the Haitian Revolution could have been the motivation for producing such a Bible without the part where Moses tells the Pharaoh to let my people go. The slave Bible doesn't include Moses leading the Israelites to freedom. It does, however, include Joseph's enslavement in Egypt. Passages that emphasized equality between groups of people were also excluded. This, of course, includes the Galatians 3.28, where it says, uh, there, there is neither Jew nor Greek, no bond nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. The slave Bible also doesn't contain the entirety of the book of Revelations, which tells of a new heaven and new earth in which evil will be punished. In contrast... One of the passages that remain was one of the ones that the proponents of slavery loved to cite. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, and with fear and trembling and singleness of heart and unto Christ. That's Ephesians 6, 5. I guess I dive down this rabbit hole a little bit to share that, and reiterate, I guess, that we have a need for greater understanding of Scripture as a whole work. See, when we pick and choose passages as a way to support our point of view, Scripture can become a tool, a tool which can be perverse to justify our own desires. See, friends, it's so important to yearn for God's understanding. This, this incredible book, handed down over millennia, when we look at this book as a whole, it's a love story. It's a love story to all of humanity and to all of creation. So, with that story of love in mind, let's dig in this morning to one of the sections of this incredible story of love through our passage from the Psalms, Psalm 116. This is part of the Psalms that are called the Hallel. If you've never heard of Hallel, you've surely heard the word Hallelujah, and you know exactly what that means. Hallelujah means to thank God, which actually is exactly what Hallel is. Hallel is the Jewish traditional way to express profound collective gratitude towards God. I want to dig into this, but before we do, there's a couple of terms we should familiarize ourselves with. These are Talmud, Halak, Mishnah, and Gomorrah. Now, I would encourage you all to take notes because this will be on the test. The Talmud is the source writing from which the code of the Jewish Halakha, or the law, is derived. The Talmud is made up of two books called the Mishnah and the Gomorrah. The Mishnah is the original written version of the oral law passed down, and then the Gomorrah is the record of the rabbinic discussions following the writing. It includes their differences of views. In other words, the law code of Jewish conduct is held in the Mishnah, and the Gomorrah is the interpretation by rabbinic scholars through the early ages. Think of it sort of like this. The Mishnah is like our Constitution. The Gomorrah is like the Supreme Court decisions which have interpreted that law over the ages, helping better define the intent and the scope of the law, also known as the Halakha. 
So, now that we have a basis of understanding, well, I hope, let's get back to this idea of halal. The Gomorrah, now remember, this is the book of the debates on the Mishnah, tells us that the halal includes five major themes. That is, one, the exodus from Egypt, two, the splitting of the Red Sea, three, the giving of the Torah, four, the revival of the dead, and five, the difficulties which precede the Messianic age. In other words, Halal deals with all of Jewish history from the birth of the nation to the establishment of the Messianic era. In Halal, Jews express their joy at past miracles and their faith in miracles to come. So, where did this all come from? Where did it get its start? Well, the Gomorrah suggests that the prayer was originated by the Jews at the Red Sea. Joshua defeating the kings in Canaan, or maybe Deborah and Barak when they destroyed the army of Sisera. This is still actually debated among rabbinic scholars today. The Gomorrah continues by saying that it might have been Hezekiah, king of Judah, when Jerusalem was, was liberated from the siege by Senhevra, or Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah when they were rescued from the oven of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, or maybe even it was Mordecai and Esther, the heroes of the Purim story. Finally, it's suggested that the sages ordained the recitation of Hallel at the time of the redemption from the later tragic events that befell the people of Israel. The Gomorrah then examines the structure of the Hallel to see if it remained static or, in fact, if it developed over time, or maybe even if it was expanded by King David. So in any case, Hallel is the cornerstone of the Jewish liturgy literally used at every major festival, depending on tradition and where you are in the world, different festivals, but it truly is this cornerstone piece of scripture for the Jewish faithful. The, I'm going to butcher this, folks, the Shunhan Aruch, which is the preeminent code of Jewish law, states that the Hallel should be said while standing up. The Mishnah Brua, which is the commentary on the Shunhan Ahra, explains why. In Hallel, Jews testify to the glorious miracles that God performed. Now, Rabbi Joseph Sloviechk, a preeminent 20th century Orthodox thinker, theorized then that Hallel is another Amidah, in other words, another standing prayer that is central to Jewish, Jewish liturgy, which would explain then why it's recited while standing. So now we understand a little bit of where it came from and the themes. What do we make of, of its purpose? Well, in Hillel, the Jews praise God's providence for the individual and for the sake of the people as a whole. In the second section, they implore God not to forsake them. Neither the nation nor the individual. In the last part of Hallel, they thank God for the miracles past, present, and future. Since Hallel is interpreted as a commandment, they always start it with a blessing. They also conclude it with a blessing, which is voluntary. The rabbis argue over whether the recital of Hallel is a Torah commandment or one of rabbinic origin, but that's really not the point. So let's turn to today's text itself. Hillel begins by reciting Psalm 113, a psalm of introductory praises. In 114, King David shows how God's providence freed the Jews from Egyptian bondage and made their survival possible. In 115, there is an appeal for God's assistance. Today's text, 116, is a plea with God for survival. In 117, which is the shortest of all the psalms, it invites the nations of the world to join in songs of thanksgiving for redemption. Finally, Psalm 118, the last Hallel, can be interpreted in one of two different ways. Either David perhaps personally thanks God for his own survival, or David represents the Jewish people as a whole, and therefore the psalm is a psalm of thanksgiving for the entire nation 
of Israel. People of Grandview, it is right and good and important to grow in understanding of our heritage texts in the Old Testament. See, we cannot fully understand the story of Christ unless and until we understand the traditions which he was born into. Now, this does not mean we need to live into the old law, no, but instead it means that we must understand it to fully grasp how the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ shapes our understanding of the new law which Christ bore. So now I would invite you, if you are able and comfortable, to stand up. Stand with me as we hear again the Hallel from Psalm 116. Let us remember that this psalm is the plea for survival. While it is necessary for it to begin with words of praise, let us lean in and hear the words of the oppressed people of Israel as they plea for their lives, as they plea for their very existence, as they plea for safety from the systems of oppression they lived under. Let us hear these words today and remind ourselves that there are still systems of oppression to overthrow, as we do not yet live in the perfected world Christ calls us to. We'll hear now from Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications. Because he has inclined his ear to me, therefore I will call on him as long as I live. The snares of death encompassed me. The pangs of Sheol laid hold on me. I suffered in distress and in anguish. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, I pray, save my life. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. The Lord protects the simple. When I was brought low, he saved me. Return, O my soul, to your rest, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. I walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I kept my faith, even when I said, I am greatly afflicted. I said in my consternation, everyone is a liar. What shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your serving girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of his people, in the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O oh Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. People of Grandview, may we yearn, as the psalmist did, for mercy in our days. May we call for it with our every breath and see it done in our days. Let us work to bring God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Now we respond to God's word by the reading of our common confession, which will be on screen. Merciful God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. 
We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. People of Grandview, hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. Let us now continue our response to God's word uh, as we focus our hearts and our minds into attitudes of prayer. I want to first off say a, a, a grateful um, thank you uh, for word this week that uh, John's surgery um, we knew last week had gone well. We did not have results yet. Um, we have found out that, in fact, his, um, his, his, his the biopsy showed it was a cancerous mass, but they believe they got absolutely all of it and do not expect further treatment needed. And boy, are we just so thankful. Um, so, so thankful that that went well. And um, we are thankful for the gifts that God gave all of those who are the healthcare workers, the um, the doctors and the nurses and the lab technicians and everyone involved uh, in his healing and we, we give you thanks God for, for that. Um, whew, that's just huge good news. We also pray for all those who are heading out into the fields full steam this week. Um, we pray that your, your harvests are bountiful um, and we pray for safety because um, no, no, safe, uh, no safety is ever guaranteed. Um, and we know that. We've heard the tragic stories time and time again, and so we just pray for you all that you have a safe and bountiful harvest um, and, uh, and that you are safely able to rejoin us uh, after that time is through. So let's, let's join now in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we are so often swept up in the tide of our generations. We have failed in our calling to be your holy people, time and time and time again. A people you set apart for your divine purpose. We live more in apathy born of fatalism than in passion born of hope. We are more moved by private ambition than by social justice. We dream more of privilege and benefits and ownership than we do of service, generosity, and sacrifice. We try to speak in your name without relinquishing our glories without nourishing our souls, without relying wholly on your grace. Help us to make room in our hearts and lives for you. Forgive us. Revive us. Reshape us in your image. And do all these things through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we now respond to God's word through our gifts of tithes and offerings. Um, I am very, very pleased and just absolutely flabbergasted, I guess would be a good word to use here, by the fact that our, uh, our, our giving continues to match very, very well uh, the needs of Grandview during this time. Um, I cannot express how uh, thankful I am uh, for your generosity and your faithfulness during this time when it would be so much easier not to respond. It would be so much easier just to say no during this time, and yet you've remained faithful to this. Um, it is truly overwhelming and uh, humbling. So thank you. 
And once again, I'll remind that we have still available for you at umcgrandview.com an ability to make a gift online, and several of you have been really taking advantage of that. And, and um, just a reminder that if you want to make a gift uh, every month or every week, that's something that you can set up to just reoccur automatically through the year. So you are welcome to do that, and thank you for several who have. And uh, of course, also respond by sending your gifts in through the mail. And last but definitely not least is a reminder that if your finances are differing right now because of everything going on, we truly want you to pause, take care of you, and think about the ways that you can give to the church through your prayer, through um, calls to others, and, and caring for the Grandview family that may not look like financial giving right now, but those are beautiful gifts to share also. So thank you for your generosity, and we will now receive our tithes and offerings. People of Grandview, receive now this closing blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, go in love, and serve the Lord your God. Send for